Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Quantum Action. We're here to take you to infinity and beyond. And with me today, we've got filmmaker Craig Campobasso from Los Angeles. Uh, with us, we're going to talk about a number of we talk about filmmaking. We're going to talk about you know UFOs and, and other interesting things. And Craig's with us today, and he's also working on a few movies and books, and he's going to share that with us. Craig, welcome to the show. Thank you. So happy to be here. How are you? <laughs> uh, all, all good. All good. So, good. Hey, you've had a great uh, career in filmmaking. So tell us a bit about yes. how you got involved in filmmaking and what movies you've worked on and that um, as an intro for, for those that are watching and listening to us today. Sure. I started very early. I started at age 15 doing film and uh, TV and commercials. Then I began working at a, a film company that made teasers and trailers when I was 17. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, I went on to work on the blockbuster Dune. Oh, Dune, this yeah. Is, this, oh, is, yeah. Uh, this was signed by Frank Herbert, one of the last signatures he did before he passed away, by the way. Okay. And um, so I worked on that for four years. And we also made Conan the Destroyer at the same time with Arnold. Yeah. And um, uh, and then at the end of that four years, Rafaela De Laurentiis, who produced both movies with her father, Dino, yeah. she said, what, what, did, what did you like? What department did you like? And I said, I like casting. Yeah. So she put me in casting on her next film, Taipan, uh, yeah. as an assistant. And then halfway through that, I got offered a job to go to Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories mm -hmm. uh, as a casting associate, a little step up. So I went there for a season and a half. And then I went back to Rafaela and started casting her movie. So I've been casting for well over 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. I do film, TV, um, you know, once, uh, once upon a time I did some commercials. I uh, now am stepping into, I've directed some projects, I write projects, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So, you know, getting into a little bit of everything out there and especially bringing it, you know, into the world of UFOs as yeah, well. Yeah. So what, what are you working on any movies right now? Um Yes, I, I, I have a war movie that is shooting right now. They just started like four days ago called Stars. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on a science fiction movie called Life yeah. Cycle 63. And yeah. it is so cool. I wish I could tell you about it, but I can't. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and then I'm starting a big giant comedy in oh. January. So oh. So you're busy. Yes, and I'm busy. And then I'm busy writing, <laughs> producing and directing uh, the my documentary to the extraterrestrial species almanac book. Yeah, yeah. So, right. And that's the, the book I have that's, here. Uh, that's probably. it. Yeah. Very, very yeah. interesting. Um, yes. And so we're do we're making that into a documentary. So all of the uh, contactees that I interviewed for the book. We went and we filmed them. So it's an extension of the book. You're going to hear about their face to face mm -hmm. uh, stories with extraterrestrials, human and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we're interviewing hybrids and yeah. different things of that kind of sort. So it's a very interesting mix. It's a documentary like you've never will have seen before. Yeah, super. So um, how did you get how did you start getting interested in the whole UFO thing? When did that start in your life? I was 26 years old and I had a major spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And during that awakening, I started uh, really delving into uh, spiritual um, mm -hmm. things with myself, how I can improve myself, what, what the universe was all about, asking myself all those questions again mm -hmm. and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started wondering about life elsewhere. So I started uh, reading up on all of the different contactees of that era. Um, back then, I knew Shirley MacLaine a little bit. So I heard, yeah, she I've told me about, yeah, yes, and, and she told me about, you know, going and visiting Billy Meyer and yeah. little things like that. I read, you know, his books. I, I found the 
uh, conversations between him and Semyaze were very, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, just gobbled, you know, just gobbled up everything, went and saw people when they would come over from other countries to give talks and things like that. And then I started uh, meeting people at conferences and started getting into with all of the ufologists. Uh -huh. And so I started going on um, uh, cases as yeah. well. And mm -hmm. one, one of the cases was a friend that I knew and uh, we flew back to North Carolina and he was taking me everywhere where they were. And then in the second part of the uh, experience, mm -hmm. he, his backyard was woods and mm -hmm. he was showing us where they were what, when he got home from the abduction by the uh, river mm -hmm. with his son. Mm -hmm. He was showing me where they started walking out of the woods and coming towards them in the ha towards the house. So mm -hmm. I was snapping photos, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And um, the next morning when I was going through my digitals, I actually got one on camera. Oh, wow. Yes. And uh, it was interesting. They looked very different than us. It was pretty, it was sort of a dark silhouette and we lightened it up. But their legs ended where our knees are. They had short little legs, long torsos. So long are they? Neck. Are they? Are these these entities are they biological or are they kind of some form of artificial intelligence or robots? We I don't think that they were robots, and neither did he. He was involved with the government with his case. Yeah. He immediately sent the picture to a high up person. Yeah. And this person said oh, wow, we haven't seen these beings since the 50s. Okay. So it was, um, you know, my interpretation that they are definitely there, but they, they weren't here to harm or anything like that because we, I didn't feel, I didn't <laughs> feel that at all when we were there or, yeah. or looking at the picture, even though it looked a little different. Yeah. So now, then you got involved in the Stranger at the Pentagon and the whole story of yes. Alien Four. Can you tell us about how you met Frank Strangers and 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 what that story is about? Because you're also uh, ready to make the movie on. You yes. made a trailer uh, version, short version of it. Um, yeah. So tell us about because this is an interesting case um, that not everybody knows about about yeah. or in that. So if you want to tell us that story, because that's really interesting. Sure. Uh, my casting partner, uh, Joy Todd, for 10 years, she's since passed on, uh, mm -hmm. she kept telling me about this elderly couple that she was friends with and mm -hmm. that they see UFOs all the time. They've had experiences. She wanted me to meet them. Uh, finally, after a couple of years of telling me about them, they came to Los Angeles. I met them. And the wife started telling me a little bit about it immediately. And she said, well... Our friend, Dr. Frank, she had this cute little Southern accent. And I, and I went, Strangers? The guy that wrote Stranger at the Pentagon? And she goes, yeah, he's a dear friend of ours. You want to meet him? And I said, yes, right? I hadn't thought about that book in years. And anyway, long story short, I was sitting with him the next week mm -hmm. in a restaurant with his secretary. And I thought it was going to be a fan lunch, me meeting him and hearing some of his stories, which he told me, you know, stories that aren't in the book and things of that nature. And um, anyway, long story short, we ended up staying in touch and bonded very, very quickly. And um, uh, he had told me about his path to make the book into a movie and how, how many charlatans had come along the way to, you know, uh, they were not good experiences, shall we say. Yeah. So, yeah. so I said, well, you know, Dr. Frank, it's just a book of vignettes of stories. There's not really anything there. And, um, and what I have to preface this with, which I forgot, is before I met Dr. Frank, I am a sensitive, I can feel and see things in other dimensions. So when they're around, I know they're around and I can identify them. Okay. So for three months prior, 
-hmm. I had just moved into my condo, set up my couches, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I started seeing Valiant Thor and his vice commander sitting on my couches in an energy form, mm -hmm. right? Well, like, it, a like a hologram. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was still, it wasn't like I saw them, it's just that I knew they were there in this invisible energy form. Right. Yeah, I, I've had and, that kind of experience as well. Yeah. Yes, and I kept wondering. I'm like, why are they? Why are they here? I have no idea why they're here. And it was for several months. And then I met Dr. Frank, and then mm -hmm. I'm telling him about, you know, how hard it would be to make it into uh, a movie, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I saw how sad he got, and I said, well, here, let me prove it to you. I'm gonna do i'm going to write out things and i'm going to send it to you and blah 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 and then all of a sudden it clicked in my mind oh they were there bringing me to dr frank to make the movie and write the script so yeah. then i said well dr frank so let's uh, so for two years i went to his house every week and I recorded him telling me stories about things that happened um, uh, when he would visit them, uh, either when he would be in Las Vegas in his hotel because Valiant so, Thor so was shit. Basically, was a friend of Valiant Thor's. Yes, since 1959. Okay, yeah. How did he? How did he meet him? How did he originally meet him? He was doing a um, a two week. Uh, engagement at a church in Washington, D.C., yeah. and each night he spoke about something different. His specialty, though, were UFOs and the Bible, and through a whole nother long course, yeah, which I won't go of, into. There's a lot of in stories about UFOs in the Bible. I don't know if you know the Italian scholar Mauro Bellino. Yeah. Yeah, well, he, he's been doing lots of lectures over the last five, six, seven, ten years. Um, about the fact that, you know, a lot of the stories in the Bible are not necessarily talking about God, but about aliens visiting the planet. Yes. Um, and the people on the ground calling them gods because they're coming from the sky. Right. Um, yeah. So I find that very interesting. Anyway, he uh, he had a picture of Valiant Thor, which was given to him by August Roberts, who actually photographed him at the Howard Menger farm. Valiant Thor, his vice commander, Don, and another vice commander's wife named Jill. So okay. he had that photo up and he would tell the story that August Roberts told him. And he would also have Adamski's photos of craft and he would talk about that and talk about the other things that were in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So from there, um, a woman approached him afterwards, showed him her Pentagon badge. She had a high level clearance. She was the top uh, uh, the head of the secretaries, right? She, uh, Valiant Thor had befriended her. And so she said, she had pointed to Valiant Thor's picture and she said, he wants to meet you. And so she picked Dr. Frank up from his hotel the next morning, brought him to the Pentagon, took him into a, uh, a room where he sat and met with uh, Valiant Thor heard a little bit of his stories. Uh, he told Dr. Frank some things about him that he didn't even know that he asked his parents to, and they confirmed. And, um, and then uh, he knew that he would see him again because he had intimated that at the end of the conversation. Uh, Valiant Thor, then, that was in December of 1959. And Valiant Thor left uh, Earth after his three-year tenure, which was on March 16th, 1960. And then he returned exactly one year later and has been here ever since. So he's, he's here doing all kinds of things to make sure the planet is really going in the right direction. They do monitor everything, even though people think that it might be going in the wrong direction now you have to go to the bottom to get back to the top. So yeah, and I, when, when I talk to people about this and they say, well, who are the bad guys? Are the, are the aliens ruling the world or what, what's going on? And a lot of people said to me, no, we're actually the bad guys. Well, not us, meaning you and me, but I mean, 
it's some humans are the ones that are, are creating all this situation that we have on the planet right now. Uh, well, we know everything is run by people who have mega bucks, yeah. right? They yeah. control the food source. They control everything. And when they keep getting bought up and bought up and bought up and bought up, right, all these companies and things like that, then one person holds this over the whole planet and and we become slaves to whatever they're selling us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But not a bit. But yeah. As, and as you say, that not not all wealthy people are evil. No, not at all. Not <laughs> but, at all. But, 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 there, but there is a group. Yeah. There is a group that control a lot of what goes on. And, right. and they're just greedy. They're just yes. greedy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, so he's still here uh, and primarily to um, uh, oversee everyone's ascension transition when uh, when we move up and out of duality, which we're in, and where we will become fully conscious like them and most of the rest of the universe. That's why all of the positive races from our universe and others are really focusing on Earth. They're up in these big starships, motherships, things like that. All of this energy is being focused so that Earth will again rejoin universal society and then be a part of the galactic kingdom, right? So that's that's a big part of what he's doing. Um, and now he's a created being, which means he's an immortal. He doesn't have a belly button. He's, you know, created beings are born from the Godhead. So they're here and they have a specific purpose, but they can also be born from a womb of light from the Godhead as an infant given to celestial parents to rear because their job might be a little different than a created being's job who just comes in as an adult because there's some kind of raising that is going to help them achieve what they're going to do once they reach adulthood, so. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, as a result of all this information that you've got, you came up and decided to write a series of science fiction novels. Um, right. So tell us a bit about that um, and, and, and a bit of the story as much as you can sort of disclose. I, I will. So this is uh, the first book. It's called the yeah. auto. The whole series is called the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga. Yeah. Um, and then each book is subtitled. This one's called I Am Tehran. It basically, um, and by the way, I leave it up to the reader to decide if it's real or not. Yeah, that's a good one. Right? Because okay. there is so much spiritual gems and truths and things that are in, in these books. Uh, that came from my spiritual awakening that happened over two years where I went from zero to a hundred in mm -hmm. two years. And then my, my, I call them my universal master teachers mm -hmm. then said, now it's time to sit down and write the books that you actually came here to write. Then they said, sit down, start writing on a legal pad and keep writing and writing and writing until you can write no more. Don't stop. Don't edit. And that's how these books came into being. Of course, I was uh, 26 at the time, and um, I didn't know what channeling was. I didn't know what automatic writing was. They, I would hear words. I wouldn't know what they were. I'd ask them to spell it. I'd look it up in the dictionary, and it fit perfectly. So, so I was just a vessel and just kept clearing myself constantly you know we ju just keep raising and raising your vibration so information comes in very clearly and uh, so really uh, what i can tell people is if you want to know how the universal hierarchy is set up this would be the book for you tehran tehran is an anomaly in their society because he was born dualistic mm -hmm. because out of every 200,000 births, there is a child that is born dualistic in the heavens. Therefore, this keeps all of the fully conscious beings aware of what it is 
to be dualistic in dealing with that person and that person gets to see what it's like when they achieve it. So we actually go on a course and see how Tehran is taught how to become fully conscious. And uh, so it's actually the reader's journey of becoming fully conscious while reading each book. Right. So it's a bit like it's a sci-fi book, but it's got personal development included in it. So totally. The reader totally. goes on a personal development journey as a result of the, the story. Yes, absolutely. Self-discovery. Now, I, I think that's a really, really good good way of putting it. Now, you've, yeah. made, you've written the script for Stranger at the Pentagon, which is a story of Valiant Thor and yes. how he landed on Earth and was taken to visit with President Eisenhower. And he spent some time at the Pentagon and, 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 and then he decided to leave. Um, and you've made you've written the script you've shot a, a trailer uh which was a short a, film yeah short film for people to see but and now you're you're you're, you're looking you're out hunting for for the capital to produce the movie properly tell us a yes. bit about you shared this with me before we started the interview um tell us a bit about the obstacles that you, you you've faced so far because i think this is an interesting thing for people to hear yes uh the obstacles are is no, it was not the money because the money you've been offered the no. money a number of times. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I turned it down. Uh, the obstacle uh, basically is if if I were to take this to a studio, mm -hmm. and they gave me the money, they would therefore want to make it into what they want it to be. Yeah. And, right? and you said you, you need about thirty to fifty million. It's sure. somewhere somewhere in there, but I can make it for less. I, I've done different budgets and things of that nature. It just depends, you know, uh, we're half, half of the movie is up there in the universe on these incredible vessels of, yeah. of uh, seeing things that we have never seen before in a movie, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and they're all up here in my mind, and I have incredible artists that can execute it, that we've mm -hmm. been doing that already. So, but the... The obstacles have been that where people want to change the story yeah. uh, or do or make it what they want it to be. And I yeah. said, you can't do that. This is uh, this is based on a true story. Yeah. You know, you you do you do have to take a little bit of dramatic license mm -hmm. at the end. But the basis and the spirituality and how Commander Valiant Thor thinks as opposed to all of the people in Washington, D.C. Now, you have to remember, this is somebody who knows what everybody's thinking. So he's not a manipulator. And really, I remember Dr. Frank telling me, he said, you know, if you ask him a question, he will tell you the truth, whether it hurts you or not, because you asked the question, he said. And people, when he knew what they were most likely going to do, he mm -hmm. still went through giving them the opportunity to correct an error. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they, most of the time, they chose not to do that, right? Mm -hmm. They chose yeah. not to accept this divine design that he had brought and shared with them on how to eliminate poverty, sickness, disease, how to prolong yeah, and, and I found life. This this is fascinating when he sat down with Eisenhower and he said, this is what we can do for humankind. And Eisenhower said, that's great. And then when he met with the industrial military complex, they said, no, we're no, not going to like that's that. Right. That's we wanna, right. Otherwise we lose control of the people. That's uh, right. And I find um, a lot of what, I mean, a lot of people I deal with for, for my business, um, they're obviously up there. They buy private jets. So they're obviously quite wealthy because if they've got 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars to buy an airplane, they obviously, I've got a lot more money. Um, yes. And interestingly enough, um, what I see now is that we are moving from a centralized society to a decentralized. And we already see this happening in, 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 in the monetary system with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which is basically, you know, it, it's, a, it's a form of currency that, uh, you know, people control. Um, right. It's no longer controlled by a, a, a select group of banks or private families that own the banks. And so they're de decentralizing the monetary system. And then with the internet, and, and we've certainly seen this with all the lockdowns and that that's happened over the last three years, that there is a decentralization of regarding information. And so, for example, this podcast that we're doing right now, I mean, if we wanted to do this 25 years ago, we would have to go to a TV station. 
get them to yeah. be interested in producing this show. And, and there are only so many TV stations and only so many shows that could be produced. Today, yeah. that, nim- that number is unlimited. Yes. And so here we are talking about this very interesting subject and, and we're putting it out there in video and audio format and whatever, and people can tune in from anywhere in the world. And so the, the, the so-called citizen journalist has been created where anybody with a cell phone can basically become a journalist and tell a story or report the news or report whatever's going on. And so information is going around the world a lot quicker now. And I think yeah. during lockdown, a lot of people that were running their companies from offices and people selling their stuff from shops suddenly realized that they could actually run their company or you know, run their so-called store online. And now you're not limited to people in your local village or town or wherever right. you live. You can now sell your goods and services to people on the other side of the planet. As long as they've yes. got a cell phone and they've got WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever uh, system they use and an internet connection, boom, you're connected. Yes. Um, and so I think this has opened a lot of people's minds. And I always tell the story of the little old lady down the road that always used to go to the grocery store to buy her groceries. And then now she's shopping on her iPad because her granddaughter's given her an iPad for her birthday and said, Grandma, you can now order your fruit and vegetables <laughs> from your iPad and your, your, whatever you need. And, and, you know, and that little old lady is not going back to going to the store because it's just so convenient to sit on her sofa in the evening and drrr, boom, do a shopping yes. the next morning. It turns up. So yeah. this has accelerated a lot of technology and whatever. And I thought, and mainly what it's doing is it's decentralizing and it's putting the power into the hands of the people. Yes. I think this is a really, really good thing because for many, many centuries, this planet has been governed by a select number of people and this select number of people now are losing control. Right, uh, that's control right. Control is going more into people like me, you, and you know other people that may be watching or listening. Uh, we, we're, ha- mm-hmm. we're getting more power because when you can store Bitcoin on, on a cold wallet in your home and I decide to buy something from you and send you the Bitcoin without having to go through a bank or a credit card company or whatever, um, that transaction is between the two of us. And yes. um, this is going to happen more and more. And this is a good thing. Um, and also with information. I mean, this whole censoring of information. I mean, Elon Musk finally buying Twitter and, and allowing people like Donald Trump and others to be on the platform to express their opinion, which I think is right. I think everybody yeah. should be able to express their opinion. Now, whether yes. that opinion is dangerous or not dangerous, that's up to the listener or whoever's watching to decide. Right. But you yeah. shouldn't be censoring someone just because their political views are different to yours. Let them express their opinion like you are free to express yours. Um, right. And let everybody freely express their opinion. Then let the, the market, so to speak, or let the people out there judge whether what you're saying is real or false or stupid or intelligent or whatever it may be. Um, and, and we're seeing that now happening, which I think is good. Um, and I think that's going to help to improve society overall by giving more power to the people. Absolutely. And like I always say, if you don't like what you're hearing or watching, change the channel. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you don't I like mean, Donald Trump, yeah. just switch the TV off. That's right. Uh, that's or, right. Or don't watch I mean, his videos. I, I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's just, um, and, and also I think, you know, uh, we need to stop pointing our finger at people and start thinking about principles. And that's yes. one of the things I like about the United States is that you have a constitution and as long as the American people and government follow the U.S. Constitution, which is principle based, I yeah. think America has a future. Um, here in Europe, we don't have that kind of thing. And the politicians are just messing the whole place up. Um, and, you know, Europe itself, the European Union is turning into a big communist state, socialist state, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing. Power mm-hmm. to the government, not to the people. Um, and here in England, even though, even though we have a conservative government, they're only conservative in name. They're not conservative in what they're actually doing. Um, right. So, you know, religion is going out the window. People aren't going to church anymore. People aren't believing in God. They're not following God or Jesus Christ and or, or none of that. Um, the biggest, fastest growing religion in Europe is no religion. Um, mm-hmm. And I think when man, and you see this, and I remember the very first time, Craig, when I flew into Berlin, I was fl- flying a Boeing 737 at the time. And this was back when the, the wall had just fallen. And so you mm-hmm. could see the contrast between East and West Berlin, and you could see the difference in the buildings and seeing it from the air as you're coming down and, you know, and the buildings are getting bigger and bigger as you get close to the ground. It was such a big contrast in the design of the buildings. And being an artist yourself, you'll appreciate this, that on the Western side, you could see that in the design of the buildings, there was like emotion, love, creativity, 
you could see that in the architecture of the buildings. On the east, they were all like, yeah, there was no, there, it was just like a, a thing with windows, and that's it. Yeah, and there was no architecture, there was no, and that's bland. Because, yeah, in socialism and communism, they removed God from Earth from from the philosophy, and they put the government at the center of the universe. Right. Um, but when you remove God from society, this is when problems start. Um, and so, you know, a connection. And when I say a connection, I think a personal private connection with a divine, however we want to call it, um, I think is really important. When you realize that there's something bigger than you and, you know, that, that rules the universe, yes. and controls the planets and the and nature and the animals and the plants and everything in that, it just gives you more purpose in life. And it, and it, I think it personally, at least for me, it makes you a better person because you, you, you're mm -hmm. thinking of the future. You're thinking of your legacy, your children and uh, what they're going to remember about you. And, you know, if you write a book, I mean, your book will be read by, you know, people in 200 years time. Yeah. And, and what are they going to say about you? Um, right. You're leaving this legacy kind of thing. And I think that's really, really important. So connection with the divine is is important for society. Um, and in Europe, a lot of people are still not waking up. Um, mm -hmm. But I must say that the lockdowns have woken more people up than, good, than, good. than I think they thought were, were, <laughs> they were going to manage to shut them down. But more and more people now are asking different questions. And I always say this, when I'm talking to somebody, it's not what they say that's important. You, the intelligence of a person, you can tell more by the questions they ask than the things that they say. Yes. Because that shows you if they're actually thinking, if they're connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think this is a really, really important thing. It's the reason why my wife and I never sent our kids to school. We've got four kids, 22, all the way down to 14, and none of them have ever been to school. Um, mm -hmm. Because school does not teach you to think. It teaches you right. to memorize. Sure. And very That's often right. the information they teach you to memorize is actually wrong. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that I've never heard it said that way. That's uh, that's really cool. Yeah. So so, you know, so the, I think we're living in interesting times. And I think the the message of these uh, cosmic brothers or however we want to call them um, is there to help us to yes. be more connected with the universe, the divine God, heavenly father, however uh, you, you want you want to call um, call it. Um, yes. And, and I think that's important because I don't think that right now. If we were given the technology to go outside this planet, that we would be a good addition to the rest of our cosmic brothers. I think we'd make a bit of a right. disaster of it. Well, uh, we would, but that's what that's why uh, you know that's why they're here to help raise us up through consciousness raising programs, through all kinds of things. That's why a lot of star seeds have different timelines where they wake up. And then they start embarking on their own spiritual journey, their own spiritual path. So, so tell me a bit more about this book here and, and how you managed to put this together, because this is uh, one of the, the best I've ever seen. I mean, you talk about these different yeah. alien races and because and people think there's a lot of talk about these gray aliens that appear in people's bedrooms at night and take them away and experiment on them. And that scares a lot of people. Um, yes. you know, when I was talking to Paula Harris the other week and I did an interview with her here on Quantum Action, she was saying about, you know, uh, there seems to be in ufology in that right now, a lot of talk about these grey aliens and we're not talking about those that look like you and I. Right. That's right. Um, yeah, so That's right. That. And yeah, see, I, I've always been more fascinated with the early contacts from yeah. all different planets kind of thing exactly like in in the very beginning so i studied uh all of those first yeah. now when when i was approached by uh redwell weiser and, and their imprint mufon books to write this book they already knew that i was connected into this whole community and knew a lot about all these different races so yeah. what i did was is i went to back to the original contactee books, right? Yeah. And I obtained permission from the authors or the publisher to then revisit what, uh, what those entailed. So what you're actually seeing in the ET Almanac are real life cases of all of these different beings. Um, some of them were, are from contactees 
all dating all the way back into the 50s. Mm -hmm. And some were current contact cases uh, mm -hmm. as well. So they're all based of, upon people's experiences with these face-to-face -face meetings, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. which was fascinating, but, you know, here's, here's the good thing for everybody to know is that mm -hmm. out in the universe, there are way more positive races than there are negative. There's always going to be a negative faction because the negative yeah, has to help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you every... know, like, I, think, I think we need the bad guy because the yeah. bad guy allows you to improve. That's right. If yes. there were no bad guys, I mean, life would be boring. That's right. Yes, absolutely. So, so that's how it came about. Um, I had to keep it under 300 pages. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was trying to figure out how many races I could fit in. And uh, I heard uh, Dr. Paul, I mean, um, Paul Hellyer uh, yeah. giving a the, speech. The and, minister, yeah. Yes. And uh, he said that he knew of 82 races that were visiting Earth. I had well more than that, but I thought, well, let's honor uh, Paul Hellyer. And let me see if I can get uh, 82 races in there. So I was able to and uh and get that in so that's how uh the book came about in a short uh you know short little thumbnail yeah and uh you know i i worked on it for well over a year and it was uh i mean i love i mean was... these these pictures and photographs and that are really really yeah. good it gives you an yes. idea and it also makes you realize that you know who knows i may have met some of these people in the street you absolutely could have I have heard some incredible stories from people. I have been in places where I looked at somebody and I was like, okay, that person's not from here. And they turn around, they look at me and they smile, right? They know what you're thinking. Because they know what I'm thinking. And I'm yeah. like, wow. And then, you know, other people like, you know, because, you know, when, rem remember when you go, when you transition off this planet and you go back into universal society, you are in your soul perfection body. It was just like Jesus. Yeah. When, when he transformed, uh -huh. he looked from whatever he looked like here, he was now the best version of himself in the physical appearance. Yeah, if you have that's one leg in this life, you end up having two legs in the other. You yeah. do. So that's why they didn't really recognize him at first. But you yeah. see this this perfect vision yeah. of, of what they are in their soul perfection body. So that's what most of them, that's why they are most mostly handsome, gorgeous, um beautiful well, you, you see the when you see these pictures or even people on video that were fat mm -hmm. and then they go on this special detox diet like yeah some of these women look really ugly when they're big and fat and and then suddenly everything changes their face their thing everything and, and they look oh yeah. she's actually beautiful now beautiful because yeah she's yeah. she's gone back to her original state uh, right. but so much that happens to us on earth can can put you completely out of shape um it and does. You, don't yeah. look, you don't look your true self right and emotions and all those things contribute to, you know, um, unhappiness and, and people gaining weight. So that's why when you can sort of grasp upon how beautiful you are mm -hmm. to all of these gorgeous beings out there in the universe and, and to God or whatever you want to call it, yeah. then, then you start to embark on a path to self-improvement, self-empowerment, self, all of these things. And, yeah. uh, and then you start to radiate, even if you still were heavy, you would still radiate beauty and joy and people would flock to you like this and yeah. hug you and, and love you. That's what I love about the Galactic Kingdom. You know, when you're up there, you still do have the emotions, although they're fused and you understand them and you know how to handle them. But if you just had a breakup, mm -hmm. you will still be sad and have to process that. But mm -hmm. others around you see it and they all gather around and they will cocoon you in a beautiful hug. They will be sending you love and they will not leave your side until you have started to blossom into feeling better. 
I mean, God, could you imagine if that happened here? Even if you were in the grocery store, no matter what, because it, up there, everyone sees everyone in, in as just a beautiful spark. So, yeah. So, so you, so you don't buy into this whole doom and gloom that a lot of people are going on about. No, like, no, not at all. Everybody's gonna die, and then Jesus has to come no. and save us. I don't no. buy into it either, and I think no. a lot of people misinterpret the Bible and the whole mission of Jesus Christ when they look at it. They don't realize that when Jesus came last time, they tortured and killed him. So right. next time he comes, he wants to make sure that, and I, the way I look at it, and this helps me with my own personal life, is that Jesus will return when there's a certain level of righteousness on the planet. So what's our mission? Our mission is to raise the righteousness of ourselves yes. and right. those around us. And That's as soon right. as that frequency or vibration, or however you want to call it, gets to a certain level, and I think what the lockdowns did, the lockdowns put a lot of fear into people. And we both know that fear is a negative vibration, a negative frequency, which brings the vibration down. Yes. Um, now the vibration is going back up again. Um, and when I think when we hit a certain number, and I don't know what that number is, that's when he will return. Yes, absolutely. And so I like to look at life that way, because if you buy into all this demon gloom, you're going to go and live in, in the mm. middle of montana somewhere on a piece of land with a hut and a bunker underneath and you're going to sit there with all your food storage and you're not going to come out in case an atomic bomb comes or this or that or who knows what yeah and you won't be living life well we need to be out there and meeting people and being positive and helping people with their problems and coming up with solutions and inventing new things that are going to improve our lives um this yeah. is what we really need to be doing that's um, right instead of trying to control everybody and yeah. freak everybody out and you know it's, it's just it's I just find it crazy sometimes. I I do too. And Dr. Frank had many conversations with Valiant Thor about our Bible and yes. things and things of that nature. And he said, uh, he said, God, however you want to look at it, right, mm -hmm. loves each and every person. There yeah. is no judgment. There yeah. is no nothing. Now, where the judgment comes in is when you leave your physical body, you will have a life review. And yeah. in that life review, you will now feel mm -hmm. all of the hurt that you gave to other people and mm -hmm. all of the joy. So if you mm -hmm. hurt a lot of people, you're going to feel all of their emotions and all of those emotions are going to overwhelm you until you can make those right. Yeah. And when you yeah, can make that, yeah, right. you're going to repent, repent. Yes, about exactly. It. And that, and that kind of thing. So it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother side of thing. I, I've had people here, uh, you know, who had since passed on, who, um, did not treat me well. Mm -hmm. And they actually came, I see people in their soul perfection body when they come to me in a dream or a lucid dream and they will come and they will ask, for forgiveness and of course i gave it to them because i knew exactly what that is this right? happened to my aunt she told me this story recently when my father there was an issue between my father and his brother basically mm -hmm. i won't go into the whole story but anyway my father passed away suddenly he was young 66 had a heart attack boom went in five minutes he was gone um shock to everybody um and it was a few months later when my aunt was driving her car and the radio started to freak out a bit and she felt my father's presence and she said to him, Angelo, I know you're here and I forgive you. And she could feel peace. And then he went. Yeah. So you're right what you're saying. And this is not yes. happened to my aunt. It's happened to many, many people. Many. If you look into it and you probably have, if you look into the all near, near death experience uh, literature that's out there and all the research that's been done and has been yes. done on near death experiences, um, you find people having this type of, you know, spiritual moment uh, as they almost passed away and you know this life review and you know what happens yeah. next and and the importance of life and why where we came from where why we're here where we're going next you know all the, those famous three questions that we many people ask themselves or are asking themselves right now um, mm -hmm. and you realize that life continues after death it's not yes. you know a moment on earth is only a bleep in eternity um mm -hmm. but it's an important bleep and what we do here and as i always say to people you know Everybody's been given 24 hours a day, no matter who you are. Everyone's got 24 hours a day, but uh, everyone's been given a certain number of talents. And it's not a matter of 
I've got more talents than you. I'm better than you. No, 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 no. How many talents do I have? What are they? Okay, now I need to use those 24 hours a day and the free will that Heavenly Father gave me to use my talents in the best possible way in the 24 hours yes. I've been given. Right. And that's, that's right. what life's yeah. about. Because the day that's we die, right. we don't take our cars and our villas and our planes and whatever with us. No, we take who we are. And who we are is a result of the things that we've learned, the interactions we've had with people, the emotions that we've felt, whatever. That's, that, that, that's you know, those are the things that we take with us. Um, yes. And I think that's really, really important. And I like this cosmic brotherhood message that a lot of these beings from other planets are, are, are sending to us. Um, and, you know, and I don't buy into the thing, this fear that like no. the greys are coming to get, take you away and put some implant, plant something into you, blah, blah, blah. But it seems like a lot of people have had this experience. Now, I don't know where these greys are coming from. Uh, I suspect they could be manufactured by man. Well, there there is a whole lot of different theories. There are uh, some of them think that they are manufactured, that they are extraterrestrial biological entities that are being ruled by some other consciousness into yeah. doing the bidding of whatever that race is. Yeah. There are actual greys that come from Zeta Reticuli. There are Zeta humans, which are the positive side of a negative gray. They don't yeah. prefer not to be called grays. They prefer to be Zeta humans, which are more along the lines of two of the races from Zeta Reticuli in the Betty and Barney Hill case. Yeah, See, or like they, or they were... Thor in Stargate. You remember Stargate? At Stargate, there was that yeah. alien, which is a gray called Thor, and he was a positive one. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so there are many, many, and there are many different sizes of the ones just with the larger eyes, right? Yeah. There are many, many, many different sizes. There are different ones. I mean, in the book, but in your uh, in, in this book, though, there's a lot of ones that look like us. There are a lot of ones that look like us, exactly. And and to make sure, you know, a lot of those. A lot of those races have multi-colors. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in the book, you know, all the pictures are black and white. So you're not going to see that they're green. Yeah. So just make sure yeah. you read the exposition and not look at yeah. the pictures. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, there is every color of being. There are beings that even have a rainbow wash to their skin. There are yeah. beings that Dr. Frank told me he saw on Valiant Thor's starship. He goes, Craig, I couldn't believe it. They had zebra skin it was like human skin but it was like a zebra a bit and, like and, there was an alien on star trek that was half black and white i remember one episode that that was that but i remembered then seeing recently linda morton howe talking yeah, I know about talking to somebody who was having visitations from beings that had zebra skin Awesome. So, so, yeah. well, you know, it's just fascinating and that, you know, there's every color skin known to man out there. So, um, yeah, it, right. it's an absolutely fascinating subject and yes. I encourage everybody to get a copy of this book. It's a good, good yes. way to start. Uh, so there'll be a link here for you to connect to Craig's website and find out all about. What and that's the new one. And that's the UFO book. Hotspot Compendium. Yeah, tell us briefly can... about this new book. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll it's a it's about going to uh, in America and Canada, thirty five yeah. of the top UFO hotspot places that were nominated by MUFON state directors. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then you get to actually uh, hear the story of what happened there. Some, some of them are where extraterrestrials have been seen and interacted with. Mm -hmm. And then at the uh, very end, it will tell you what was Project Blue Book or MUFONs mm -hmm. or yeah. other investigators, uh, what mm -hmm. is the current state. Some of these have been reopened, so we have that in there. And mm -hmm. then it gives you um, all the things to do when you go to that location, the phone numbers, uh, you know, websites, all of that. So if you want to book your little bucket list trip, yeah. right? Okay. 
It's yeah. very cool. And and I do have the coordinates to like where Adamski met Orthon, yeah. where Valiant yeah. Thor's ship is at Lake yeah. Mead, uh, okay. where Travis Walton was abducted, you know, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, you know, all of those different things. So, so and, yeah, so anybody that's interested in the UFO subject, this is a great book. If you want to yeah. book a holiday to America, uh, you need to get this book to plan your trip. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go uh, to all these different locations and just keep your, your phone filming because those will be some great YouTube videos to do uh, by, by, by doing having that type of tour of America, yeah. the uh, different UFO hotspots. Great. Thank you very much for being on Quantum Action. Thank and you. Thank you for watching and listening. Remember to subscribe to Quantum Action. We're here to take you to infinity and beyond. And I think today we really did talk about infinity and yeah. beyond. <laughs> and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.